Good evening and welcome to episode number three of KBTV, the Kennington Bioscope YouTube live edition hosted by me, Michelle Facey, brought to you by the feverishly busy Bioscope team pulling together behind the scenes with film collectors and the kind cooperation of archives from national film collections. Thank you so much to all of them, particularly the I Film Museum and curator Elif Rongan Kainache, but also to you, the viewers, reviewers, tweeters, Instagrammers, chat boxes and emailers who have sent us so much lovely, loving and positive feedback, expressing your enjoyment and appreciation for our efforts. We're really most grateful and hope you also enjoy tonight's show, for which I'm also debuting my new webcam. So hopefully you can at least hear and see me better than last time. Any difficulties for which I do apologise. We're all learning here. Our first two films will start us off with a bang. La Bouteille de Patouilla, Patouilla and the Bottle, sorry, is a film from 1911, held in the I Film Museum's Jean Desmet collection. It features comic actor Paul Berto in the lead role, who starred in dozens upon dozens of these short, anarchic film doozies for the French Lux Company as Patouilla and other personas besides. His regular director for these, Romeo Bossetti made in excess of 300 comedy films, including the Rosalie series starring Sarah Duhamel, Kalino starring Clement Mege, Little Moritz starring Maurice Schwartz, and even found time to star in his own Romeo comedy series to boot. In common with many featured comedians in films at this time, they may be known by several names, particular to whichever country in which their films were shown. And from the Dutch title card that you'll see, Patouillard with his champagne bottle is clearly known to the Netherlanders by the name of Jibouille, and in the UK and USA, he was simply known as Bill. This one reeler features a fantastically high-vis, high-fizz run around the streets of Paris for the comedian and his bottle. And as is often the case for these kind of comedy shorts, part of the pleasure comes from sights of the real surroundings and interactions along the way. Patua takes some repose by a bill poster, which an eagle-eyed commentator on the Eyes YouTube channel had noticed advertises Britain's own 
Miss Campton appearing at La Cigale as the first named headline act. Underneath that is La Revue Sans Culotte. Brighton's Miss Amy Campton, celebrated star of Parisian stage and screen with her own comedy series as Maud, has been the subject of extensive research by our own David Robinson, who's given fascinating presentations for us on this heretofore forgotten lady with the bioscope at the Cinema Museum and for Bristol's Slapstick Festival, on which occasions I was lucky enough to be present. This sparkling short comedy enjoys an equally effervescent accompaniment by Bioscope, Slapstick and Radio 4 regular, Mr. Colin Sell, recorded especially for tonight's show. Our second film appears to be a real rarity, a D.W. Griffith two-reel drama from 1913. Fate is listed as existing in the archive of the Library of Congress, but possibly we think only on a paper print. The copy you will be seeing now comes courtesy of the collection of Malcolm Billingsley and is from a digital scan of a 35mm safety print taken from his original nitrate source, which he'd saved from, as he put it, certain destruction and donated for safekeeping to the UK's National Film and Television Archive. So thank you very much to Malcolm for this. Fate's young female lead is Mae Marsh, then just 18 but looking considerably younger. She'd been hanging around the Biograph lot where her older sister, Marguerite, was working until one fateful day she caught the eye of David Walk Griffith. Griffith, a stage actor and writer, had joined the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company in 1908, rapidly turning into the prolific director of whom none of us can be unaware. He was guilty, amongst other things, of playing his coterie of actresses off on one another. And so it was, and so, sorry, and so it was that leading girl, Mary Pickford, when she refused to play a particular role for Griffith and therefore was denied a subsequent role as punishment, was pushed aside in favour of the more pliable and later self-confessedly at that time, Lame Brain May, who would also feature in his most notorious film of 1915. A most notable actor here is longtime star of stage and screen, Lionel Barrymore, the eldest of the famed siblings from that great professional acting dynasty. This serving of dramatic fare was described in its review by Moving Picture World in April 1913 as easily the best offering of today's regular releases on account of its tremendously effective climax. This film will be accompanied in a pre-recorded segment by the superlative Mr John Sweeney.
Well, that was very dramatic, wasn't it? Thank you, John, so much for playing for that and for Colin for the first film. Our next film is a delightful little comedy from 1912, an office junior-based battle of the sexes entitled Revenge is Sweet, made by the Edison Company. The Moving Picture World magazine wrote of it for its imminent summer release of July 17th that Jimmy has a good job in an office where there is a bevy of pretty girls, but being at that age where his appreciation of the fair sex has not developed, he considers them inferior to him. 
so it is his pleasure to make all the fun he can for himself at their expense. Now, this film is fluffy adolescent fun, but what makes it remarkable is that in amongst the cast of Office Girls are not only Claire Adams and Bessie Learn, yes, Bessie Learn, not Bessie Love, who you may remember featured in our previous live broadcast of socially distant films in another Edison production, Over the Back Fence, in which she found herself separated from her neighbourly beau and future director, Harry Beaumont, but here also joining her in the office are Gertrude McCoy, prolific silent film actress and occasional screenwriter, whose last role was playing Lady Hamilton in the 1926 BIF British instructional films version of Nelson. And far, far more than an occasional screenwriter can also be found embodied in the figure of Jeannie McPherson, another regular silent screen actress of the teens, but much better known and renowned as the woman who wrote scenarios for the films of Cecil B. DeMille. Like Mae Marsh, who we saw in the last film, Fate, McPherson had her first taste, taste of filmmaking working for DWG at Biograph in 1908. In 1913, the year after the film we we're about to see, she wrote, directed and starred in The Tarantula for Universal, in which she would kill men with a bite after luring them into obsession and tiring of them. She went on to form a formidable, formidable alliance with DeMille, penning 30 of his pictures. And in 1927, she became one of the founding members of the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences. So within this little film, from little office acorns do epic production oak trees grow. Now let's see this fun little Edison comedy, Revenge is Sweet, from 1912, accompanied by the incomparable Mr. Colin Sell.
Thank you, Colin. That was great. Thank you very much. And just for the record, it was Jeannie McPherson's desk who contained the much coveted face powder. It was exactly a year ago this very evening when I first saw our final film, The Twins, screened at the spectacular venue of the Eye Film Museum in Amsterdam as part of the Women and the Silent Screen International Conference, whose theme for the edition was Sisters. The nature of the film, as you can glean from the title, clearly lent itself ideally to that programme, but it was the lead actress playing a double role as the twins, separated in infanthood, growing up to lead very different lives, who was so very remarkable, making it one of the jewels of the conference. For it was famed film director Lois Webber herself, seen here in 1911 in a rare surviving early print, freshly identified for conference, from the Eyes Desmet collection by curator Elifongan Kenichi. Professor Shelley Stamp, the authority on the career of Lois Weber, who was much celebrated in contemporary times for her three decade career of solid and touching work, in publishing her 2015 book, Lois Weber in Early Hollywood, undertook major research to restore Weber to her rightful place as one of the three great minds of early American cinema, alongside D.W. Griffith and Cecil B. DeMille. Weber had been brushed aside for far too long, written out of film history, when it becomes patently obvious, looking through the film and trade magazines at least, that this director was of enormous standing and renown and a major name at Universal Studios, their top name, in fact, in 1916. Interestingly, Jeannie McPherson, who we talked about and saw in the previous film, appeared a year after making her own film for Universal, The Tarantula. She starred in Lois's first feature-length film as director, The Merchant of Venice, from 1914, a year in which Weber helmed 27 moving pictures. The Twins, released on June 15, 1911, produced by Edwin S. Porter's Rex Film Company, which in 1910 employed both Weber and her husband, Philip Smalley, who also appears in the film, assuredly demonstrates Weber's thoughtful and steering hand on its penmanship, touching on many topics close to her heart. In the notes for the film's screening in Pordenone last October, Shelley Stamp wrote that although the husband and wife team were initially credited only as actors, Later accounts make it clear that the pair also co-directed most of their films from scripts penned by Weber, releasing one film per week at the height of their productivity. Weber's storytelling skills are on display, even in an early film like Twins, as are her commitment to social justice and her interest in unconventional women who become agents of change in their own lives or the lives of others. We worked very, very hard, Weber later recorded the time she spent at Rex. And thank you, Shelley, for your notes. A review in Moving Picture World was full of praise for the production, acknowledging the long lineage of twin-related storylines, but praising this film for its refreshing take on the typical shenanigans that usually ensue from having two identical people wandering around the place, causing mischief and mayhem as endurably enjoyable, though that is and probably always will be, with opportunities afforded for camera trickery and the use of doubles. The reason for that difference in this case, said the review, is because the twins are played by the same woman, Miss Lois Webber, in a dual role, played by the gifted leading lady of the Rex Company with her usual full power. They praise the story for being logical, original and convincing, also expressing admiration for the backgrounds which they say appeal so much to the eye that they cause the beholder to yearn for green fields and blue sky. Something we can all relate to, I'm sure, for those of us still in lockdown mode. And the review reveals a little production insider knowledge when they tell us that very few people will believe that the outdoor scenes were taken during a heavy downpour of rain at the very unusual hour of 7pm, which certainly attests to Lois's comment about working intensively at Rex. After further praise for Lois, Miss Weber is of course as charming as anyone could wish, Moving Picture World concludes, and don't worry, there are no spoilers here, that the ending is one of the neatest little bits of suggestive work that we ever saw, and we are sure that every exhibitor will breathe a sigh of relief and whisper amen when he sees it. Certainly, Weber's stories and film appearances were clearly appreciated by the film-going public, and in my research for tonight's show, 
I found an inquiry from a film magazine letters page desiring to know the identity of the featured woman in the Rex company's pictures. So let's see Miss Lois Webber now playing a beautiful dual role as the twins, accompanied live for you by Cyrus Gabrish.
Thank you so much, Cyrus. That was fantastic. And thank you to all our pianists. Thank you to Colin Sale and John Sweeney and Cyrus Gabrish for putting on such a fantastic show for us. And thank you so much also to our colleague Todd Higginson for his preparation of the films, all the things that had to be done to put the films on the screen looking so good for you and translation of intertitles and all sorts. So thank you, Todd. And thank you to the Cinema Museum, the volunteers at the Cinema Museum. The Cinema Museum remains closed for now, but will reopen as soon as humanly possible. So just keep keep tuned for details of, of you know, event and news to come. And you can do that by following the Cinema Museum um, on Twitter, um, looking at their website, subscribing to the Kennington Bioscope um, emails. If you go to kenningtonbioscope.com, you can sign up for regular email updates to find out when our next broadcast will be. Also our Twitter page, at Ken Bioscope, and on Instagram too. And um, all of this show is put on for you for, for, for free, obviously. But if you wish to, and I know some people have wanted to, we have a donation page, um, a coffee page. You can buy us a coffee. That would be lovely. We'd very much appreciate it. And that you can find the link for that on our YouTube page um, on this um, broadcast or on our Twitter page header. And thank you to all the Bioscope team. Thank you especially, of course, to Malcolm Billingsley for his print of Fate. Thank you so much. And uh, it looked fantastic. And as well as sounding great as well, of course, John, thank you. And also very, very much our thanks and appreciation goes to the Eye Film Museum in the Netherlands and Elif there for all your help. You've been tremendous. So thank you so very much. Thank you all for tuning in and you know, I wish you all very well. Have a good, pleasant evening and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you. Baby, precious baby, did I do? 